Uh, it's not too bad. It's uh, 6 a.m. New Zealand time. Great. Well, good good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Cancer Patient Lab. Uh, today we have a special guest, uh, Ian Lewington, uh, who has uh, been a member of the Cancer Patient Lab for quite a while and has helped us out um, with uh, managing our finances, and so we're we're thankful for that. Uh, but Ian is here today uh, to talk a little bit about um, his his journey uh, and his treatment options and mm -hmm. tests he's had. Um, and really to get advice. And so this is what we would kind of consider a hackathon where we're using um, the crowd, the community in this case, uh, to help um, uh, Ian find um, options that may not have been on the table um, prior to this call. And so uh, we're thankful for Ian. Uh, and just as a reminder, this session uh, will be recorded and will be made publicly available. If you prefer not to have your name associated with this session, you can exit and watch the recording later. You can turn off your camera uh, or you can remove and edit your name from your Zoom credentials. Um, and just remember that the information and opinions expressed, <clears throat> excuse me, during this call uh, are not intended to be uh, medical advice. You should always consult your doctor uh, for anything specific to your needs. And so with that, uh, Ian, I will uh, turn the baton over to you and you can present your case and uh, hopefully we're going to get some lively participation. Yeah, yeah, look, uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, and I guess uh, probably the over, overall uh, rationale for uh, this is that I've learned a lot from the group and uh, being in New Zealand, uh, uh, we're interesting talking about the FDA, but the... Uh, Approval authorities in New Zealand are uh, even worse than the US. Uh, our MedSafe, uh, the only approved uh, metastatic prostate cancer drugs are gozerelin and abiraterone. We don't have any access to uh, the likes of enzalutamide or the newer, newer drugs uh, without it being self-funded. Uh, and... What I'm keen to do is get a view on uh, potentially whether I should seek some further expert advice in the States. I've had a recent meeting with my oncologist, so I'll just recap on all of that and uh, really quickly on my, my history. So I, I was diagnosed in OBO uh, stage four advanced uh, metastatic in uh, June 21, uh, PSA of 542, extensive bone mets, uh, no organ invol involvement, as, as with a lot of people. Uh, at least in nine, so uh, very aggressive. Uh, started um, gozerelin, uh, six rounds of docetaxel, uh, which got the PSA down. Uh, added bicalutamide in December 21. And it, my PSA kept coming down till about March this year. Uh, and at that point, it started to rise albeit slowly initially, um, up to 0.15 in October, and then it pretty much doubled in November, 0.26. And uh, the oncologist viewers are now developing uh, resistance. Uh, and her uh, recommendation is I move to abiraterone and prednisone as the next stage treatment. Uh, and potentially with a PARP inhibitor, Ali uh, Oparib, I'm not quite sure if I pronounced that right. Alarib, uh, I think. Oh, oh yeah, Ari Alarib. Uh, the only issue with that is uh, that it's not funded in New Zealand, so that will cost me about uh, 60,000 US a year, uh, which is uh, uh, pretty horrendous. Uh, and... Uh, I've just had a liquid biopsy done, which has gone up to Singapore uh, to test for new mut mutations to uh, decide whether or not it's worth adding in that um, PARP inhibitor. Uh, my initial biopsy showed that I had P10, P53 mutation or loss and uh, a couple of other uh, mutations as, as a lot of people do. Uh, but there are options there. I have consulted about having uh, lutetium, uh, actinium treatment, 
uh, quite keen on looking at uh, bipolar antigen therapy, given that my last PSMA scan, which was about a month ago, showed that bone mets were quite small with low SUV expression, around two, uh, with nothing significant showing up, and they've all shrunk from the year before. So the PSA rise is uh, separate to the existing METs, it would appear, and perhaps it's just indication that there's some circulating tumour cells or something that's starting to trigger a uh, PSA rise, hence the uh, oncologist's uh, desire to uh, introduce abiraterone and prednisone into, uh, into the mix. But what I'm, I'm keen to do is discuss with the group how that might be approached in the US, what other options it might, that I might consider. Uh, I can travel, I'm, I'm still quite fit, I don't have any bone pain. Uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the Mayo, or the Moffitt centres and uh, other um, centres of excellence up in the States and uh, just how I might pursue treatment op options given that uh, uh, you know, I'm still at the initial start of a, what could be quite an accelerated curve given at least a nine. Uh, well, I, I could maybe uh, start us off here, um, Ian. So uh, I've seen, oh, so, so I was diagnosed in 2016. Um, and I also have a Gleason 9, so aggressive cancer. Uh, my my METs are, well, they started out being primarily or only tissue-based. Uh, they're now uh, they're now bone METs, but they're uh, kind of localized. Uh, but in any event, uh, you know, my first treatments were uh, surgery, radiation, um, then I went to apalutamide, which is a second line hormone therapy. Um, you know, so that would put that in the same category as abiraterone. Um, apalutamide, by the way, also goes uh, by the name of Erlita, E R L E A D A, I believe. Um, uh, Apalutamide was uh, was very effective for me uh, for a while. I think maybe I got you know, at least 15 months or so of benefit from that, where my PSA was was uh, remained pretty low. Uh, so when I say low, like below you know, three. Um, and then I went on a holiday. I, I and when I when I when I talk about like a second line hormone therapy, I, you know, I've been on Lupron, uh, first line hormone therapy pretty much since January or uh, today, March of 2017. So very early, you know? Um, and, and so that's just like, a, that's just like a, that's a given, you know, in my, in my situation, uh, which is interesting. But um, so I got about 15 months of benefit from apalutamide. I went on a holiday. I came off of that. I came off the holiday and my cancer just came like roaring back. Like my PSA just, just went through the roof. Um then I, I, I had, I think I had another surgery. Um, uh, I, I did a few things, but I ended up doing abiraterone and abiraterone. I, I think I got about, oh, about 14 months of benefit from that as well. Um, and I can share you, share with you my journey. I don't want to detract too much uh, from this, but I'll, I'll share with you like my whole PSA chart and the overlay of my treatments just so you have that. And in that, you, you might find some treatments that can be um, used as options. It also has what my genomic mutations are, my proteomic uh, signatures, et cetera. So I'll, I'll share that with you um, uh, as, we, as, we, uh, as we wrap this up. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I would say that, um, you know, a second line hormone therapy like abiraterone or apalutamide for that matter, or, you know, some people get a, a lot of benefit from enzalutamide. I'm sure there's a, folks here that are going to chime in regarding some uh, darolutamide as well, uh, regarding those those four second line hormone therapies that can be very, very helpful. Uh, but I would just say uh, if abiraterone is uh, on the menu, um, I think it's a good drug. It was very effective for me. I didn't have tremendous side effects from it. 
And so it's it seems to me like that's kind of an easy option, um, at least a second line hormone therapy, whether it's abiraterone, uh, enzalutamide, darolutamide, or abiraterone, those four are all fit within that category. Um, it seems like that could be like a very effective next step for you, but um, I'll open it up to, to others who may have uh, thoughts. Uh, David. I'll uh, uh, add to what uh, Brian was saying. And uh, when I became castrate resistant, uh, my next uh, therapy was abiraterone and um, I got excellent results for it. So, um, so I, I hope that's encouraging. Uh, it, it's a little less clear in my case because I was uh, eligible for and encouraged to enroll in a clinical trial that a, that in addition to the abiraterone put me uh, down for uh, six cycles of cabazitaxel. So the the excellent benefit that I've uh, had since then could be attributed to one or the other or both. There's no way to know. Um, but uh, I've had uh, uh, enduring uh, benefit. It's been two and a half years uh, almost, no, it's been a full three years since I've been on, since I started abiraterone and my PSA is still very, very low. So I hope that's a little bit encouraging that it's, it's worked well for me. Yeah, I did read, um, uh, some of that, the studies about Kipitaxel, um, and, uh, the benefits of that. And it's, uh, whilst I'm not keen on, uh, further chemo, it is a, uh, uh, potential option, uh, even though uh, I'd have to fund it myself to have that with abiraterone, because uh, it does seem to be some clinical benefit. Like I said, I've had I had very good results. I found the side effects from cabazitaxel to be uh, harder to deal with. Um, I was very glad not to have uh, more cycles than I did. Um, so. Uh, it's worked out well for me. It may well be that abiraterone alone would have been enough for the same benefit, but I'm in the camp of hit it hard and hit it early as you can uh, while you still have the greatest strength and stamina and resilience. Yeah. Did you have docetaxel initially as well? Or was that, was that your first chemo? Yes. I started out with Lupron and docetaxel. I got very good results from that. It brought my PSA down into single digits um, but, uh, I hit a nadir of, um, one and a half, uh, about two months after I finished, uh, uh, docetaxel and then I had a slow rise. So when it doubled from nadir, I was at three and that's when we started, uh, plans for the next set of therapies. And by the time I started abiraterone and cabazitaxel, it had climbed up to four and a half. So, um, I'm not. I don't even remember what that calculates out as a doubling time. It was several months still, um, but it was accelerating. And uh, I got uh, very quick results. And um, I reached a nadir of uh, 0 0.01, perhaps uh, 10 to 12 months later. It was a steady drop, and it has stayed down at that level ever since. Again, I don't know if it was one or the other or the combination, um, but uh, I think abiraterone is a uh, uh, a very good next step to pursue. Great. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, Bob, you have your hand up? Yeah. So, I mean, I would agree that abiraterone is a good next step. Uh, unfortunately for me, it didn't do much. It, it, I failed abiraterone within a matter of like four months. Um, in terms of seeking treatment outside of New Zealand, it might be a lot easier to go to Australia. I know they have a lot of things available there that maybe you don't have in New Zealand. Um, certainly with your SUV values, you're not, at least at this point, a good candidate for uh, lutetium, you know, I think they want you to be in the teens or higher to really, but I don't know if Zofigo, radium-223 is available. 
in New Zealand, but radium. Uh, yeah, it, it is available. Okay, because that that it, that goes for bone mets. Oh, you know, and only bone mets. Yeah, I talked to a, um, a doctor, uh, Nat Lenzo in Australia, who uh, some of you might have um, heard of, who does uh, plevicto actinium uh, combination uh, treatment. But uh, he, he was the same view as you, that uh, I needed my ECV uh, over 10 uh, for it to be uh, really a candidate. Um, so I'm probably not wanting to pursue that at this stage. Yeah. Is, is, is radium 223 funded for you? Uh, no, I'd have to pay for it. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Amit. Um, I had kind of similar, a few comments uh, uh, to what Bob said. I think given your SUV values, it doesn't look like um, you know, going the route of the radio ligand therapy right now, at least would be the primary option. And uh, seems, I don't know about New Zealand much, but it um, seems like Australia tends to be, you know, more cutting edge and and um, kind of ahead of the curve in offering treatments that are not available even in the U.S. So, I, I you know, before exploring the U.S. options, um, you know, obviously, kind of getting to getting to Australia might be simpler and um, simpler and easier. Um, I mean, uh, some clarifications I didn't quite um, um, get it in the beginning. So, have you uh, have you been on Enza, uh, which is Xtendi? Have you been on that yet? No, I've had uh, nothing other than. Gozarellin and uh, docetaxel and a period of bicalutamide. Okay. I mean, I have had a tough journey, as you probably know, um, mm. after my initial docetaxel and, you know, Lupron, we get started on Lupron uh, right over here. Um, Enza Extendi, which is, you know, which is very similar to um, Zytiga, uh, Abedetaxel, uh, I was given um, Enza first, and that gave me a 12 months of stability. I won't say that it brought down my um, PSA, but it kind of kept it flat in the single digits, which was, you know, that's as low as I've ever gone in anything. I've never, you know, um, so, so I'm kind of looking at my PSA chart and probably the longest response I got from any drug was uh, Xtendi, um, Enza. And um, that was 12 months. Um, and then I switched to uh, Zytiga Abilatron, and I probably got about nine months of response on that. So typically you get about, uh, the, the data is that, um, you know, if you follow each of these, uh, um, you, you know, 30% uh, chance mm -hmm. that you will get a good response from, you know, one uh, ADT after the other. Uh, so my suggestion would be again your your your, your PSA is relatively low. I Me, mean, of course, it's not an ED type of situation, but your PSA is pretty low. And if you can maintain it for a year, year and a half at that, and it seems like some people get pretty long response on these things, uh, I think that would be the way to go. And I don't recall I me. Mean, this was back in twenty nineteen and twenty. I did not have any meaningful side effects from either of those things at that um, the, at, at that point in time. So I would say uh, th these are easier to kind of take. These are just oral drugs, you know, kind of going to IV infusions and stuff like that. Now that said, um, um, given your P10 mutation, and I missed uh, some of the other mutations you have, um, obviously looking at any of the trials or any very targeted therapies around that. Uh, I, I don't have that uh, P10 or the other uh, mutation you mentioned, so I am not knowledgeable specifically on those. But, um, you know, sometimes, uh, so my suggestion would be kind of maintain, if you can maintain this low uh, PSA that you have for some period of time and then look for the targeted trial option to try and hit because trials and other things, they are just better done early in the early phase uh, like somebody else said, like, you know, when, when you have 
pretty healthy. You can afford more risks and stuff like that, and and you can go through through a trial and see if that that helps. So, but radio ligand doesn't seem to be the path right now, at least uh, based on my experience of where you are. So. Yeah. Um. The thanks, Amit. So, so um, Ian, there's a there's a few uh, additional thoughts I have. And then I, I I'd love to kind of pull uh, John uh, into this conversation too and his experience with bipolar androgen therapy. Um, but I'm gonna put in the chat here. This could be useful. Um, and we'd, I'm not gonna pull it up right now, but but it's something that you know. These are just um, these are resources i think for for you to kind of think about um and everything is in the google drive which uh you have access to if you don't have access to it let me know um but i'm pretty sure you do uh but what i just put in there is is basically uh how i thought about various treatment options and um this was back in 2022 uh and what i did was i work through our partners here with the cancer patient lab to take my electronic medical record information and all of my genomic reports at the time. Uh, and, um, and then I worked with, I think at the time, three different, three different groups. Uh, one was uh, massive bio, which is in New York. And, um, uh, they specialize in in clinical trials here in the United States. They 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 may be international now. I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, but again, they're using your EMR and your genomic profile as well as other criteria to look for clinical trials. It could be useful. Um, I also worked with uh, Cancer Commons slash Xcures. Uh, they have a a very uh, simple um, way to upload information, and then they will. Uh, they'll come up with treatment options that can include clinical trials, uh, standard care treatment options, uh, as well as targeted therapies. And then um, the other group that I worked with was CureMatch, and CureMatch specializes in combinatorial approaches. Again, these are U.S.-based firms, but the, the process is pretty painless, and it could help you to identify treatments. You can just look at this spreadsheet that I just dropped in in the uh, in the mm -hmm. chat and you can kind of see how how I kind of approached it. You know, one component is, okay, <clears throat> what is the target that I'm going after? And so I've got, for example, I've got a, a PBRM uh, alteration. I got TP53, I've got um, uh, another one, which escapes me right now. H-E-R, you have H-E-R. Oh I, yeah, you're right. I have I have a HER2 uh, uh, relatively high expression uh, RNA expression, not a not an alteration, but a, um, a, a, a high RNA expression. Um, so in any event, you know, um, maybe the way to think about this is 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 there sort of like a maybe a bridge strategy for you to take something now that can um, keep your ch cancer in check um, or or, um, or, uh, or or minimize it while you're looking for other targeted therapies that might take mm -hmm. a little bit longer for you to identify. The identification process is actually pretty quick. All three of these vendors that I just mentioned, they they came back with recommendations. I think within two weeks, so it was it was pretty quick. Um, were they were they actionable, Brian? Were you able to? Uh, yes, yes, they were. Oh, good. For example, um, uh, so, some of them were not. So I, I would say Cure Match. I don't think I, w w Cure Cure Match was a little bit more of a challenge, just because getting a physician to uh, to um, to prescribe uh, combinatorial drugs. Uh, is, it can be a little bit challenging. Like what's the dosing strategy, um, for example. Um, but yeah, B7H3, uh, for example, uh, and uh, the B7H3 antibody drug conjugate was identified. Um, there's also um, uh, trastuzumab uh, for in her for her too. Um, and there were some others um, that, that, uh, uh, that, that came about as a result of that. 
And so, I, you know, I think um, working with Cancer Commons was really helpful for me um, and Massive Bio as well. I think that those were the two. But as we kind of, you know, have evolved, if you can get, you know, uh, RNA expression, then we have partnerships with Shepherd Therapeutics and genomic expressions. And so, you know, that, that can help, and they will help to identify um, uh, targeted therapies for you. So, so anyway, so, you know, cause I was in your shoes, uh, that's how I approached it, which was, okay, you know, let's do something that is sort of within standard of care, at least in the United States. Um, and while doing that, um, you know, try to identify, you know, other targets that you can go after so you have options. And that becomes powerful because when you go, when you, when you have a conversation with your doctor and you talk about these various targets and you talk about associated treatments, it kind of, it can open up new doors for you. And I'm not the only one who's actually gone through that process. Uh, there, there are other folks within the cancer patient lab who've also done that. And they've identified uh, treatments that were previously not on the on the table um and i can talk to you you know um offline if you want to about mm. any, any of that stuff um but but that is one approach um so that approach again is you know have a bridge strategy maybe it's a standard of care option second line hormone therapy can be very helpful while you're using all of your genomic information and getting new genomic information to identify new targets and new treatments so that's one one path another path which is why i call john into this is is bat you know is bipolar angina therapy something that um would be uh that that you might respond to and right um, so I don't, one, so, one third of people go yeah. ahead buying them yeah 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 so, so you know we, we had we had a session on bipolar angina therapy from um dr uh anton rakas uh so mm -hmm. that's one of our recorded sessions and so you know that like it's like a, a third of their patients see like tremendous response. A third see uh, sort of like stasis where their PSA just kind of like reigns flat and there's no progression, which is great. And then a third kind of see their, their cancer take off. Um, and I don't know if there's a test right now that will help us determine which you, which you, you know, which bucket you would fit into. Um, but I think that that would be a, a very interesting approach and that fits into the whole lane of adaptive therapy. And again, you know, we've had, um, we've had, uh, you know, several sessions uh, on adaptive mm -hmm. therapy um, and uh, that, that uh, use uh, test. There's actually one that's, a, that's um, a clinical trial out of Florida that is using abiraterone on a, an adaptive therapy approach. Um, so anyway, so I don't know, John, you want to talk a little bit about your experience because your experience is even different than the, what uh, Dr. Antonarak has talked about because you're using Russ's protocol. Right, right. Um, I am. I'm, and another thing, Ian, is uh, Russ is a good source for you for BAT. If, and I'm sure, I think you've already communicated with them on I, it. Yeah, and, I've and talked Paul, to um, Russ. Yeah. And Paul, Paul Van Camp is awesome. He, he has a different uh, BAT protocol but he's also did the j591 in uh in australia and i i thought he had bone a bone mets a couple bone mets I'm, but i'm not sure but he's a uh he went there and it was it's about eleven thousand dollars to get it done but uh i think he did it for it's just two sessions and and i think you were familiar with that i think i, I read some of your bio you were thinking about j591 right uh yeah i, I think i've heard of that yeah, so so bad. So what I'm doing for bad is uh, it, I'm hormone sensitive, so I'm not castrate resistant yet. So that's why when when we say one third of the people respond, so that's a castrate castrate resistant uh, group, you know. So for hormone sensitive, we're, we're kind of like breaking ground with a lot of this stuff. I mean, we our goal is really there's two goals on is to uh, not is to delay, and we don't even know this the results of this yet is just to delay castrate resistant and to have a better quality of life, you know, instead of staying on constant ADT, we cycle it. And and you're familiar with all that. Uh, but I being, 
So being hormone sensitive, there's no trials. There's nothing for me to get into uh, except, I mean, I could go into a trial where it was the, what Paul does is you do the long, uh, you do sipinate, testosterone sipinate. But it's a, it's a, um, when you get into the trials like that, it's, you're stuck in, uh, in a cookie cutter situation uh, where it doesn't matter what your PSA is doing. You know, you just do it for this month or uh, uh, three months, and then you go and do the test, um, the, um, your testosterone for, uh, I mean, your uh, ADT for uh, another month. And then you go back and forth with the same set of goals, same set of time frame. And that's not, for me, that's, uh, I have to be flexible. And so I had to talk to my doctor at Mass General and uh, he was receptive. So that was really great. But I had to get, I have to get the drugs myself. So I, I buy testosterone propionate and like with Rush, we inject every other day. We do that for two weeks, you know, uh, and then we do uh, about two weeks of darolutamide. That's the stage I'm at now. Uh, and it's flexible because, uh, like, for example, I went on a vacation. I wanted to uh, – it was going to be, you know, kayaking and hiking and all that kind of stuff. So I stayed on testosterone for another week. Uh, and it did bring my PSA up quite a bit. Well, quite a bit being uh, 0.17. And so – from a 0 0.07 so it did go up but you can't worry about that too much so i just stayed on darolutamide for when i went on my adt session i stayed on darolutamide for next week and i brought it back down so it's flexible um non-trial but uh it's so far i mean i've been on it for uh, i guess 20 weeks now um and it's it's working i i definitely feel better it takes a little bit of tweaking to get things you know going like we have to take a thing called letrozole to stop the uh, our estrogens from climbing too high, you know, because uh, when you're taking testosterone, high testosterone, you're going to get a lot of estrogens going down what they call the aromatase pathways and into your estrogens. You're going to get estrogens way too high, and that's dangerous. So we have to keep track of that. And we just do a lot of testing. Now, I don't know how your testing is done over there, but in the U.S., we can – we had this labs you can do on your own and that's what I do. I mean, I do quarterly. I do my regular oncology labs, you know, but every pretty much every other week I'm, I'm buying, I'm, I'm buying labs through quest diagnostics and doing, going and having the blood drawn myself, you know, and a doctor signs off and I don't even know who the doctor is, but that's how we keep track of where we are with our, testosterone, a PSA, and a, my E2. I do E2 all the time, estrogen, estrogen uh, because I, those are the three things I really have to watch. So, I mean, it's an option. I, I, I like the idea of uh, staying with what everybody's saying is staying on that abiraterone for, as a bridge, you know, and that would give you time to relax a little bit and focus, like get those uh, cancer common things done or something if you want, or do more research yourself. And, um, and, and, and it gives you focus on, on those things instead of just worrying about everything, you know? So it's good to have a, a direct focus on where your cancer is. Like you have TP, you have the P53 gene. Yeah. So th there's plenty of, plenty of information on that to, to focus on and trials and stuff like that. So I'm not, uh, I know that's a pretty serious gene uh, and, and you have quite a few bone vets. Is that what it is? Uh, yeah, they were extensive all up my spine, through my ribs, uh, mm -hmm. pelvis. Yeah, and so there's just too many to zap, I guess. Yeah, correct. And I've um, I've had various consultations with the radio radiologist. I only had one round of radiation because I had a large met pushing on my spinal or yeah. close to the spinal column, and I yeah. had that before I started docetaxel. Yeah, so that's your other option then is uh, bad. But like one third, uh, if you're not getting any pain from bone mets, you can you can try bad. But if, as soon as you start getting pain from bone mets, you got to kind of get off of it because it, it it will create your testosterone to 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 uh, grow and your cancer to grow. I mean, your testosterone will grow up or grow your cancer. But that's the whole idea of it. it keeping it we're keeping it hormone sensitive, and then we're just hitting it again, you know, uh, keeping it uh, not hormone sensitive, androgen dependent, I should say. And, and, mm -hmm. and then we hit it with, then we, so it's that extinction level stuff that 
uh, Dr. Siegfried of Boston College talks a lot about uh, hitting it like uh, with different, um, get it happy and then, then hit it hard and get it happy and hit it hard with extinction level events. That's kind of what we're doing with the cancer, you know? Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not really in your shoes, you know? I mean, uh, I'm not castrate resistant yet. I'm, I know it's going to go there, but I'm just trying to delay it is all I'm doing with a quality of life. Um, uh, th thanks, John. So, uh, Ian, just on the adaptive therapy component and, you know, because Adoradarone is, you know, are, is in your sites, um, Jeff Krolik, uh, do you know Jeff? He's, he's on here. Um, I can, I can drop his, uh, on here. Um, he is doing adaptive therapy with Bob Gattenby and he is using Adoradarone, uh, as his, uh, treatment um, agent. I think he's doing it along with Orgavix. So he's cycling between uh, between between those two. Well, and yeah, he's not he's not even using testosterone. Um, so it's kind of like he's just watching his PSA. Um, and and you know when his PSA increases to a certain threshold, which is based upon a model that Bob Gattenby um, has, and I believe it's customized for him, but just confirm that with Jeff. Uh, uh, as it rises, then he he starts uh, Orgovix and um, Abby, I believe. And then and then uh, you know, his PSA comes down and then and then he takes a, a break, watches his PSA go up. And so it's just kind of like this watching your, your PSA kind of like move. Um, <clears throat> I put in the I put in the um, chat uh, a couple of links regarding uh, Bob's discussions with us. One of them is really a, around just the whole theory that Bob um, approaches cancer with. And so I think that you'll find that interesting if you haven't um, uh, heard it, which is his basic idea is that we should be trying to manage cancer as opposed to going <laughs> after a single extinction event, which is kind of like what you know our, uh, our general approach is. Uh, so it's really fascinating. Um, and something that maybe you could talk to your doctor about, uh, uh, or other doctors is appropriate, um, uh, if you're going to be going after abiraterone. Yeah, my, look, my oncologist is, uh, receptive to the idea and she's done a bit of research. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's only other, one other person in New Zealand that's done, uh, BAT. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's a little bit, uh, out there from a New Zealand perspective. So, uh. I have been firing off some of this information from the group yeah. and yeah. Uh, Russ's information. Um, uh, yeah, because uh, like a lot of people here, I'm not keen on uh, the slow slide. If I can get a bit of qu better quality of life and uh, yeah. extend things while some of these new treatments come on board, because there's clearly no right answer at the moment. Yeah, right, yeah. Well, I, I will tell you that. So I tried that, and you'll you'll see this in my journey. Sorry, I'm I'm probably inundating you with the whole bunch of links and whatnot. <laughs> but um, uh, I did I did do bat for about three months. Now, again, this was just uh, in June of this year, and I ended up doing cipionate as opposed to propionate, and I think that that was a mistake. Um, but you'll see my you'll see my chart. My PSA went from I think about a. 3.5 up to an 11 after the first round and then um it started to come down and it kind of like hovered at about eight and a half or nine for a few months and the way that i did it was i, I had um scans before and then i had scans three months after to see what was going on and I thought that I was going to fit in sort of that middle third tranche where, <laughs> you know, it was just going to maintain stasis. And unfortunately I saw radiographic progression after the, the three months. And so I ended up kind of hitting the brakes on it and um, with apalutamide. And so um, I wouldn't say that it didn't work for me. Um, you know, I would consider doing it again. I just don't think I would use cipionate because I think that that the the half life of it is longer. And 
than propionate. And so I think it's just harder to, to manage that way. Um, I think propionate is the way to go. Um, it's, it's good because it's, it's, uh, you can do, you can find out in a couple of weeks. I mean, yeah. it would sipinate it last, it'll last your whole month. Right. I mean, yeah. So propionate only lasts a day, uh, you know, basically two days, every other day you have to inject. Um, and so you're hitting it hard, a high, and then you're stopping it right off when you're done. Sipinate kind of gradually goes down. And if you, if you had done propionate near the, a certain level of uh, time of your sipinate, like maybe the last couple of weeks, that might have been, uh, and that's what Paul does. That's an option there, you know. Paul's actually starting to do that. He's been doing that recently. Yeah, uh, Paul Van Camp. So I think um, uh, given kind of what Ian said, I mean, I considered that, Ian, and I decided not to do it. And I'll, I'll, there may be some similarities here that you have to be, watchful of. Uh, uh, I have a lot of bone mats uh, very close to spine, and I've had multiple growth in those mats where, you know, spinal compression has happened. And while radiation takes care of those, and I've, in the uh, in past uh, 15 months, I've gone through four or five radiation treatments. The The other issue is that if, you're ner if you get nerve compression, the recovery of the nerves doesn't is not guaranteed and can cause long-term effects. And I'm dealing with some of those. So I have I have a lot of meds very close to the spine. I've gone through skull-based radiation. I've gone through cervical to thoracic uh, uh, radiation, thoracic uh, spine radiation, lumbar spine radiation. Um, I would say uh, the pain stuff goes away with radiation because the tumor is kind of gone, but the, the nerve compression issues that happen, I have maybe 75% recovery on those uh, and they become a, become long-term issues. So I would be very careful in clearing up uh, any mets which are close to a spine and mm -hmm. you might get an effect that you may not be able to recover from that. So I would consult I, I would really look very closely to the scans and some of the doctors. You can. Um, so that's that just my kind of viewpoint. I I consulted with, uh, I think, all five doctors about that. And I was given a, basically a no because of that. Re because of that and my personal experience that, look, this is not, this is something you can, you know, get yourself in tr more trouble with. So. Yep. Good points. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll just add some context to that too. Um, there is another session, uh, Ian, that we had with Bryce Olson, uh, along with Bob Gattenby. Um, Bryce was a, a patient. Uh, he had been battling prostate cancer, uh, for about eight years when he tried that in, uh, 2022. And, you know, we don't know for sure, but uh, shortly after, I, I would say, well, shortly, maybe like five, six months after he discovered that he had um, METs in his liver. And the theory was that they were, uh, those cells were sort of like dormant, those cancer cells were dormant, and potentially the testosterone just made them bloom. And, uh, you know, uh, he ended up uh, finally uh, succumbing to his cancer, uh, and it was due to the liver mets. Um, also, uh, Rick Stanton, uh, who I think you know, uh, co-founder of the Cancer Patient Lab, um, he believes that he tried BAT too, and he thinks that he had a flare of cancer in his bone marrow again, probably sleeper cells that may have been fueled by testosterone. So, you know, these, you know, so we know uh, two patients uh, for sure that have, or it looks like have fit into that group of a, a third where their cancer takes off. <clears throat> um, both of those patients use cipionate. And so that's why I would say I would think long and hard about, you know, which drug you would use. 
And I, I don't think that probably cypionate is the way to go. Um, I, I think propionate is the way to go. But I would also just heed uh, on its warning. And, and yeah, the, definitely. Some of the experiences that we've had in, in the past. Uh, yes. And the reason why I, I did it, I should also mention this, is that my my mets were really localized to my pelvis. So I don't have distant mets. Um, but I did see... Um, I saw bone mets, which I never had before. Um, they appeared after bipolar androgen therapy. So, yeah, these are just words of caution. Um, but again, bipolar androgen therapy is just a version of adaptive therapy. It's just using testosterone as the agent to create the cycles, right? Jeff Krolik is... is He's using, uh, he's not, he's not using testosterone. He's using uh, Orgovix, Orgovix and I think Abiraterone. Uh, but, but talk to, talk to him um, because I do think that Bob Gatton's approach is uh, intuitively adaptive therapy makes just a, a lot of sense to me. It's just. Yeah. It's a lot safer a than when you have bone mats in the spine for sure. Yeah. Um. Okay, I think there was a hand up. Uh, no, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so let's. Let, uh, uh, oh, good. If you do propionate, Kiwi drugs, I think uh, they're in New Zealand, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, you can, I think you can get propionate from them. I buy it from uh, uh, steroids.click. That's where um, Russ had turned me on to. And um, it takes about a month to get in. But uh, that's where I buy my propionate. I mean, I have to buy it myself, you know. So the doctor, I didn't even ask him to prescribe that. I don't even think they would. So, but like, I, in the midst, that is, um, is the bone spine, the bone that's going to be, uh, that's a tough thing to think about. So yes yeah, so, so you know i think we've given you some food for thought mm -hmm. i think the the challenge here is how do you access some of these things that we're talking about you know um so i put in the link there i i do think it's a uh, good advice to to maybe go to australia it's a little bit closer peter mack is like they, they've done i know they didn't uh they've done a pioneering pioneering work with lutetium um so uh so i'd give that uh, some serious consideration. Uh, not an expert in what they do, but I, I do know that they've they've done a lot in that area. Um, yeah, no, I have heard of that uh, institute. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, we're we're coming up on the hour. Yep. But I I want to make sure that you're getting what you want, or do you have other questions? Uh, no. Um... The uh, the chat box does that stay? I'm not that familiar with how the uh, Zoom works, so I can just access it. Yeah. After the I'll, call, I'll uh, I I think I'll get like a little um, chat uh, kind of like excerpt, uh, and I will I'll, I'll send that to you. Uh, if not, okay. I, I I've got the links in my head, so I'll I'll send, <laughs> I'll, I'll send them to you. Okay, uh, no, much appreciated. That the, the chat window does not persist once the session is closed. Yeah, uh, yeah, but some, some, with a recording, you like I get uh, like a little transcript of the chat, so it it should be in it should be in there. Uh, uh, so I'll uh, I'll send that to you. If not, uh, I'll I'll send I'll just I'll pull them again. I, I know which ones they are. Yeah, no, no. If you're able to send that, that would be lovely. Um, look, uh, much appreciated, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I'll uh, I will pursue that and talk to my uh, oncologist a bit further. She is um, actually really good. She's uh, receptive to these alternative conversations and some of the things that aren't trials and standard of care, which I know a lot of my previous oncologists wouldn't wouldn't look at anything that hadn't been through the uh, uh, whole trial process, which uh, is as you were saying at the start isn't. Uh, ideal for us on a uh, shortened timeline yeah yeah 
so, so I think, you know, what I think we can help you with is, is provide a means to get a menu of options. So I yeah. kind of walked you through that process. Perfect. And then once you have a menu of options, um, again, you, you know, to have that, you got to have, you know, your basic electronic medical record and you need to have genomics, right? And so yeah. I'm assuming that you can get access to some sort of uh, testing. I've got, I've got all that and I'm uh, just waiting to get a liquid biopsy uh, genomic testing back. Okay, great. Do you have any tissue-based? Um, um... Uh, yeah, I do. The initial, um, that's where I uh, uh, got the results around the P10 and P53 and there's a couple of other mutations. Yeah. So, so, so basically the, those are like the building blocks to be able to get some, some options. And so the spreadsheet, the treatment spreadsheet that I send you, which I'll, I'll send you again. So you have it, um, is using that as the foundation to identify different options. And then I took, I had like 21 different treatment options across those three, um, service providers. And then, um, I took that into my doctor and we, we talked about them and we said, okay, Hey, which ones make sense, you know, just so that you're covering all of your bases. Um, and um, it's an it's an iterative process. So even though like I haven't really refreshed that since, you know, since last year, uh, those options are still on the table. And so okay. I, can, I can keep coming back to them. Um, so anyway, um, you know, develop that menu of options um and then it's i it's going to be figuring out the access component and hopefully she can help you with that oh, that would be excellent no thank you very much everyone i'll let everyone uh, get on with the rest of their day or evening or wherever it is awesome okay well thank you ian appreciate it and thanks everyone for for joining thank you very much take care